Well, good morning, everyone. It's really good to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Dana Murphy Parker, and I am the president-elect of the International Nurses Society on Addiction. And I'm very happy to welcome you today to this webinar by John Silvani, Methadone Then and Now. Uh, the webinar has been approved by the California Board of Registered Nursing for one nursing credit and we will provide more information uh, about how you receive your credit, uh, your certificate for credit at the end of the webinar. This webinar is sponsored by the International Nurses Society on Addictions in conjunction with the provider's clinical support system. Funding for this initiative was made possible in part by a grant from SAMHSA. The views expressed in written conference materials or publications and by speakers and moderators do not necessarily reflect the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services, nor does mention of trade names, commercial practices, or organizations imply endorsement by the U.S. government. The overarching goal of PCSS is to train healthcare professionals in evidence-based practices for the prevention and treatment of opioid use disorders, particularly in prescribing medications as well as for the prevention and treatment of substance use disorders. Today's webinar is being presented by John Silvani. John is the executive director, sponsor, and chief operations officer at PAX Treatment Centers in Middletown, Ohio, which I believe is right outside of Cincinnati. John has been working in the field of addictions since 1989. He operated a methadone treatment program for 31 years, he graduated from Southern Ohio College with a degree in computer science and then graduated from Miami University with a degree in applied science and nursing. John began nursing as a ventilator nurse before taking over as a supervisor in the methadone treatment program in Cincinnati, Ohio. He took his test to become a CARN, a certified addictions registered nurse in 1998 and then became a certified addiction specialist in 1999. As a licensed counselor specializing in all aspects of MAT and substance use treatment, he's developed several programs in 1998, such as the Mothers on Methadone program with the help of Dr. Fenergan. He currently operates an opioid treatment program in Middletown, Ohio, where he has methadone and buprenorphine patients. John has assisted in training physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses and counselors in Southwest Ohio in the addiction field. He was recently honored as a fellow of the Academy of Addictions Nursing, and he is on the County Mental Health and Addictions Services Board. John has served as a director at large since 2019 for the International Nurses Society on Addictions, and currently he is the interim treasurer for the newly formed INSA USA. So the goals of this webinar are to review and examine changes in opioid treatment during the past 57 years, to discuss the relevance and roles of modern day treatment and discuss the need for new best practices. It is with great pleasure that I now introduce you to and turn you over to John Silvani. Good morning or good afternoon. And some people it might be morning, but it's uh, 12, uh, a little bit after 12 in uh, Middletown area near Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, the first thing I would like to do is I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about why I did this. Methadone uh, has been one of my main things that I've been doing now since 1989, since I walked into the treatment program. And I wanted people to know um, where it came from and where it's gone and the differences that, uh, that make it. So I'm gonna share a screen with you with, um, uh, with uh, our stuff here. Hold on one second, let me get this to come up. Oh, uh, Robert, Robert's still on uh, sharing a screen. Oh, Robert. Robert. Yeah, I need Robert to, to let me share my, okay. Okay, he's up, in the, well, in, until he comes up. Go ahead, John, you should be able to just share it now. Okay, let me click okay. that on. Let me see, still giving me a hard time with it, but you know, let me see if I can get back in here. Do you want John, do you want Robert to help you do that, John? 
Yeah, if you can get me in there, I'll, um, I'm trying to get it, but it's uh, it's not showing. But Robert, can you help Don bring the uh, slides up, please? Okay, give me just a sec. I'll get them opened here. Okay. But anyway, so I, I can tell you a little bit of, about what what I'm doing is that um, um, I've done a lot of uh, things in the state of Ohio. I've I've helped them uh, develop the new policies and procedures. And um, okay, there we go. Here it is. Well, and I named this methadone, and now I think you can see it now on there. And I'm going to go down the, the slides, but I'm not going to read every one to you. We um, can't see it still. You still can't see it? Okay. Yeah, I think you need to have host uh, sh to share this, your screen. You don't have host. Okay, hold on a second. There we go. Hold on. Now, can you see it? Yes. There it is. Yeah. Now we got okay, it. Go ahead and run that. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. There you go. Sorry about that. I'm, uh, but uh, methadone. I made. I named it methadone then and methadone now, basically, because it's been a long and winding road that includes the many changes that we've had in opioid treatment and opioid use disorder, and. Um, Kind of, uh, as, I'm going to go to the, the next slide. Kind of what's happening now is history is repeating itself. The opioid pandemic has been upon us, but is not new. All the names change, but the deaths remain the same. In 1989, in the state of Ohio, there was only nine OTPs, opioid treatment programs. And that's uh, where we uh, did just methadone pretty much at that time, because there wasn't any other, other things out. They had lamb for a while, but that didn't last very long. And today there's 92, as of today, there's 93, and there's 40 plus waiting to become licensed. The transition from treating heroin dependency to now treating fentanyl, carfentanyl, along with oxycodones, oxycontins, opanis, and the other assortment of narcotics, truly like night and day. Historically, a patient presented with heroin dependence back in 1989, some in Ohio were dependent on what they called Dilaudid and, uh, and tall, uh, with Talwin and Dilaudid. Talwin with, mixed with tre trepanalamine uh, was T's and B's. And we even had a program that handled that early in 1988. Typically, a patient would be placed either on methadone around 30 milligrams and incrementally raise the dose until signs of withdrawal dissipated. 60 to 70 milligrams would would take about two weeks, three weeks, and then we'd end up um, pretty much blocking the, the dose of heroin that they were using. This was called the blockade dose, meaning that that dosage a patient would not feel the effects of injected heroin. They tried many times to, and then most of them would quit and come in and say, finally, um, it doesn't work, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to make methadone work. So that's what, what happened, um, and they became methadone clients. Replacement therapy, it was called at the time. There's some pioneers in the field that I want to, uh, you know, talk to you about. Um, uh, Vincent Dull uh, was an American doctor who, along with his wife, Marie Neiswander, developed the use of methadone to treat heroin addiction in around 1964 in New York City. Uh, he was an endocrinologist and uh, she was a psychiatrist. And they, uh, they were together for a long time. She passed away. Uh, early, much earlier than him in 1986, but I got a chance to meet Dr. Dole in uh, 1998 at an ATOD conference in New York City. John, can I interrupt you a minute and just yes. say that some people are saying they're having a hard time seeing the slides. Could you please put it in presentation mode? You know, maybe just go to the slideshow up top and do from okay. the slide. Let me see presentation mode, share. In just, just go to the slideshow on top, I think. And then yeah, move your mouse up just a bit to where it says slideshow. Yeah, just up a bit, your mouse at the okay. top, slideshow. Okay, hold on a second. I've got, um, right, hold on a second. I've got new it looks share. Like a screen. It looks no. like a screen. The icon looks like a screen. If yeah, you yeah. go, if you go to slideshow, um, you yeah. can present the whole, um, the whole slide as one just page. Click on okay. slideshow there, John. Okay. Up at the hold top. on. I'm trying to get there right now. Says you are sharing. Is it under there? Where? Uh, I think if you hit F five on your not keyboard. New slide. Slideshow at the top. Go up a little higher. It's one, two, three. It says file, home, insert, design, transitions, animations, slideshow. Is right in the middle. It's right in between animations and review. There you I got go. It. I got there it. Go. All right. So now put it on which one? And then one? do it from current slide um, over on your left, the second one. 
current slide. Okay. Is that better? There you go. Yeah. Okay. That better, everybody? All right. Is that better? Yes. Yes, definitely. Yes. Yeah. I am so sorry, better. guys. Yeah. I, I don't do this every day, so I <laughs> <laughs> just want to let you know. Okay, so uh, Dr. Uh, I was we're going back to Dr. Uh, Nyswander and Doe uh, began first viable exp experimentation with methadone and it changed thousands of lives in that process. Like in 1963, Dole and Nyswander began a project to evaluate methadone for the treatment of heroin addiction. And they chose methadone because of its long acting medication that could be taken orally. Prior to this, they've tried many other, uh, other types of drugs and, and it didn't work. Even in Lexington, in Kentucky, they, they tried uh, all kinds of stuff uh, that, that obviously had shorter life, uh, you know, half-lives. Methadone was demonstrated to have a therapeutic effect of 24 hours, known as a half-life, and most people know that. But methadone administration could, could be limited to once per day. That was, a, that was also good. This was a tremendous benefit over opiates such as heroin and morphine, which have lives of about four to six hours, need to be administered three to four times a day. Um, Dole and Eiswinder thought it possible that heroin addicts were motivated by a biological need for opiates and that, and that this need resulted from either an inborn deficiency or the effect of damage created by chronic administration of heroin. Regardless of the origin of the deficiency, they believed that a possible solution was to provide methadone um, uh, for uh, to provide to addicts a medication that would satisfy their physical cravings for opiates and decrease their drug-seeking behavior and the concomitant crime and antisocial behavior uh, required to obtain illegal drugs. Okay, all right. So methadone treatment. Oh, I gotta keep getting there. All right, keeps going back. Okay, uh, let me go back down. Come on, excuse me. Methadone treatment, again, a, a very long and winding road has been the most praised and at the same time damn treatment modality for the treatment of addiction. We've had a lot of problems with methadone because of the stigma caused by uh, how, not in my backyard and a bunch of other things that over the years. And I'll get to something uh, that's going to probably um, be very strange to some of you, but I'll tell you about it. Methadone maintenance, most widely used treatment, most widely evaluated. It's more evaluated than any drug that's, that's on the market today. Few other treatments in medicine, psychiatry, or psychology have created the furor and the controversy that methadone has generated. This controversy has resulted in much misinformation about the nature of methadone, the medication, and methods of treatment. In the 1980s, with the HIV AIDS issues, methadone became another useful tool. It can be used to help those who had seen the needle and felt the damage done. Now had a way to keep from using the needle and alleviate the strong cravings that opioid dependency brings about. So in the late 1980s, the term called harm reduction was coined for substance use disorder. And the first of the needle exchanges were created. And in the mid 1990s, harm reduction became important due to the many people were injecting heroin and the prevalence of hepatitis C. At one time, we had 85 to 95 percent prevalence in our in our uh, patients uh, having hepatitis C plus being addicted. What is harm reduction? Harm reduction in the United States, the research perspective, and an archive to David Purchase, managing a patient who is addicted to a drug with clean needles and a set quantity of drug. Additional information is not possible for all addicts to become drug free. Harm reduction seeks to minimize the harmful effects while maintaining a person at a functional level. level excuse me, And this was submitted by Thomas Dryling back in 2016, which I thought was a pretty close uh, way of uh, explaining harm reduction. Anybody has any questions at any time during this, please let me know and I'll be able to talk to you about it right then or ask, answer a question. In 1989, methadone was not supported by Ohio Department of Alcohol and Drug Addiction Services. We had only a 12-step person that was in there and we fought and fought. It was 1989, methadone treatment was not supported. Heron was ravaging the bodies of people of all ages and, and store owners were still complaining of shoplifting being out of control in and around Cincinnati, Ohio. 1976, they complained about that, and that's when our methadone program first opened. State of Ohio, where only nine narcotics treatment programs existed and less than adequate medications were being given because of the glass ceilings on that were placed on methadone at the time, uh, change was very slow. Going 
backwards there. Here we go. Mostly ops. Uh, um, when, when, when I walked into the narcotics treatment program uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1989, I was truly amazed at how the patients, they were normal, everyday people, and mostly white, Caucasian. Although we were in a catchment area, which was predominantly African-American, our clientele was 95% white with a 40% 40, 40 uh, population of African-Americans. No advertising and dare not have a sign saying anything about methadone. In 1999, we were a blind dosing clinic. Today, there's no there, blind dosing has gone. It's mostly obsolete today, but back then it was used to focus on treatment, not doses. Blind dosing has been gone for years in Southwest Ohio as we continue to learn more and know how it did not help as, as we thought it would. In 1989, heroin and pain pills were the opioids drug of choice, um, the drugs of choice. Dilaudid was a big drug in, in this part of the uh, country, used often in the Midwest and especially prevalent in Cincinnati, Ohio. Methadone treatment, which is consisted of medication, individual counseling, and group therapy. That's in our OTPs. Typically getting patients off heroin worked well with daily ingestion of, of methadone. In this state, only liquid methadone was allowed and the typical doses range from about 30 milligrams to 80 milligrams. Today, today is totally different. This was due to the strict government standards provide uh, administration standards provide methadone programs at the time by the federal government and the oversight of our state. We had a very, very strong um, uh, state uh, program that uh, monitored us. We didn't have a SOTAs at that time, which is a state opioid treatment authority. So from 1976 to 1989, methadone was still in the beginning stages in Ohio. And the first programs came in at 19, around 1976. And by 1989, we were still struggling as a viable treatment option. Abstinence was still the only way for some folks back then, still today. The important thing to remember is that with methadone, a person injecting heroin daily could be helped with the use of methadone. Uh, actually, at my program, the one that I was at 31 years, uh, when I left there, we had 75% of our patients that were not using anything but methadone. Methadone worked, and no matter what amount of heroin was used, 65 milligrams of methadone daily would help them remain free from heroin. Why 65 milligrams, would you say? Well, it's common knowledge that th at that time that somewhere in the range of 60 to 65 milligrams of methadone would block the effects uh, in, their, in their brain, their chemical, um, this was the blockade dosage. Some people call it a blocking dosage, blockade dosage. Uh, methadone is pronounced methadone in Ohio. It's methadone in New York, if anybody's from New York. So just, uh, uh, I'm actually originally from New York, but uh, if you ever hear somebody saying that, that's typically where they're from. This worked since the patients tried to use heroin on top of methadone, but soon found out that it did nothing for them except empty their wallets. 65 milligrams of liquid methadone hydrochloride is a small amount of medication to save a life. So are more than one life when dealing with a pregnant opioid dependent mother and her unborn child, our children. I'm gonna show you a little bit about the effects of, um, uh, of uh, we, we did this with our ADIS boards in, in the state of Ohio recently. Methadone was found to be a brain stabilizer and with the half-life tends to keep patients satiated for 24 to 30 hours. This was why the idea of methadone treatment programs seemed to be the answer for those dependent on dilated morphine, codeine, and heroin. And this is uh, normal levels of brain activity in a PET scan shows up in yellow to red. That's normal, looks pretty, nice because everybody's got the yellow in there, which will be what we want. Reduced brain activity after regular use can be seen even after 10 days of abstinence. So if you're on methadone and, uh, and that, you'll, you'll start to see a little bit coming back in 10 days. But after 100 days of abstinence, we can see brain activity starting to recover. And this came from uh, down at the bottom, Volco. And uh, why use methadone? There are three main reasons that people who are addicted to heroin use methadone. To quit heroin, to cope with pain, and reduce harm, reduce harm caused by injecting heroin. As a treatment, methadone does not actually stop the opioid addiction. Instead, it is a substitute for heroin. People who take methadone as prescribed are still dependent on opiates on a physical level, as the methadone blocks the opioid receptors in the brain that are usually blocked by heroin. This stops the craving that people feel for heroin when they have been taking it in large doses for a long time and prevents them from feeling ill from heroin withdrawal. 
And if those of you don't don't have never spoken to anybody that's in heroin withdrawal or uh, any kind of opioid withdrawal, it's uh, kind of like the flu on steroids. So I put a little thing together of methadone then and methadone now. Methadone in the 1980s in our section of the country, like I said, nine OTPs and Ohio's a pretty big state. Some states today still don't have a methadone program. Methadone in the 2020s, 92, 92 OTPs. We just got the third, 93rd one with more, with more than 40 waiting. Doses were lower, 40 to 80 milligrams. Doses range from 40 milligrams to 300 plus in the state of Ohio now. Drugs, heroin, and pain pills were, the, were what was the choice back then. Today, fentanyl, carfentanyl, and all the other things that come with it. Opana, uh, the lollipops, all that stuff. Stigma uh, existed. Stigma still exists. Yep. Take-homes were Sundays, up to 28 days of take-homes. Take-homes in the state of Ohio, you have to give them out in bottles, and they have to have 28 little bottles to take with them. So they have to have what we call locked containers to take that medication away from the from the building. And uh, it's um, it's it's useful, but it'd be so much easier to give them a bottle and lock it in a little small container that could be put in in uh, in a uh, purse or in somebody's pocket. But they still haven't changed that. So that's one of the things that methadone then and methadone now tells you is not changed. Long waiting lists for methadone. Few waiting lists for methadone in the state now, very few. I can get somebody in, if they come in in the morning, I can have them dosed by the uh, afternoon. Oh. Behavioral therapies, medical services, social services, spiritual well-being, medicated assisted treatment. That's what's happening now. In the earlier years of methadone treatment, the dependence on heroin and other opiates was the focus. In 2021, the whole person is being treated in good OTPs or opioid treatment programs. We have, met, we have everything that's on there in my program and most programs that are opioid treatment, um, there are other type of programs that are not opioid treatment. Uh, they can give out Suboxone, but that's the only thing they can give out there. All right. Daily methadone administration was developed back in the day to mimic the way a typical heroin dependent person would handle their addiction. Person would typically wake up early and have a wake up shot to get them going in the morning and start their day. If they did not have this early morning injection, they'd be in a panic and hit the streets trying to procure a hit of heroin. Methadone treatment programs open very early, five to 6 a.m. Each morning and patients usually are there before the nurses. They would make the best employees if they would come every day like that. That's what I tell them. But uh, they receive their dosage in the morning and then they're ready to face the day. Now this alone helps, but does not fulfill the entirety of what true treatment is supposed to accomplish. Getting off opioids is typically not hard. Staying off is at times impossible. Um, and I said there was a change is gonna come. In 1998 at a Todd conference in New York City, the news was New York Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, some of you have heard of him, announced the end of methadone treatment programs in New York City within the next four years. Obviously it did not happen, but many people were in fear that it may happen. Luckily, we had advocates like Mark Perino, president of ATOD, General Barry McCafferty, the former director of Office of National Drug Control Policy of the United States. He was the keynote speaker that year in New York City and was totally against closing methadone treatment programs. He was why, one of these reasons why I went and became a, an addiction specialist. Methadone has constantly had to fight for its place in the treatment lexicon for the United States, a constant struggle, even when studies and outcomes support the use of methadone. Um, this has changed very little in the past 23 years. People still do not want treatment programs where they reside. As Vincent Dole, Dole stated, we, we feel treating a person with methadone is like treating a diabetic with insulin. The methadone treatment programs in the past typically rewarded those who remain compliant by medicating daily, visiting their individual counselor, possibly attending a group therapy by giving them what was considered a take-home dosage for Sunday. Most places back in the 1980s and 90s only allowed weekend take-home dosage. My treatment program had seven patients out of 150 that got Sunday take-homes. Treatment programs were open seven days a week, they said they were not there for the uh, convenience of the nurses. So that's why they said we'll stay open on Sundays. 
And uh, that that became an issue because none of the state uh, programs are open either Saturday or Sunday, the state uh, uh, people that were doing our regulations. This punished the staff and did not allow for breaks and routines that became stagnant and intolerable at times. So how does methadone work or MAT works? I, I wanted to show you the, the three different um, type of um, drugs that we that's used now today. Methadone is a daily liquid. In some places, it's, it's a diskette or it's a pill. And uh, it's dispensed only in specialty, specialty uh, regulated clinics called opioid treatment providers or opioid treatment programs. And how medications work in the brain, most of you that are, that are physicians, nurses, and even counseling know about the receptors in the brain. And uh, buprenorphine, suboxone daily, is a daily dispenser prescribed dissolving tablet or film under the tongue. And naltrexone vibratrol is a daily pill or monthly injection, and patients have to abstain from opioids for seven to 10 days before receiving this medication. But as you see, methadone is a full agonist and it uh, it's generates the effect, it fills up the receptor. Buprenorphine is very sticky and it uh, partial agonist, so it generates a limited effect. And uh, now Trexone just blocks it. It doesn't allow uh, any, any opioids to get in. And uh, that's why you have to be abstinent for a number of days and start on uh, pills. The 2000s with MS content, let's see, I gotta move this over. And the pain being the fifth vital sign changes from big pharma, and I do mean pharma, with the spread of fentanyl and early induction, uh, introduction of the drug OxyContin, also non-addictive. <laughs> the drug's names had changed, but the song remained the same. OxyContin and OxyCodone were the new heroin. Easier and cheaper to find. Pill mills came into being and overdoses began to rise incrementally. People made a living out of procuring opioids for others and physicians became the new drug dealers. This went on until around 2014, when fentanyl now took over as the opioid that everyone wanted. Fentanyl or duragesic were used for terminal cancer patients and those suffering from severe pain problems. A company named Insys began a campaign spreading fentanyl like it was candy. Actually, they did have a lollipop, so I guess it was candy with fentanyl. When pharmaceutical fentanyl became more expensive, China began to develop knockoff fentanyl, an elephant tranquilizer, car fentanyl. Fentanyl with a half-life of four hours became the most dangerous injectable drug in the world until car fentanyl came up and showed its ugly head. Also, it's 10,000 times more potent than morphine, 10,000 with a seven hour half-life. Historical transitions of, excuse me, of OTP care, historically and presently. MAT options, especially in the OTP setting, considered a last resort for patients who had failed at multiple treatment attempts, often including detoxification and residential stays. How many people have come and uh, uh, into our programs that have, are on their seventh or eighth time? MAT options today include the OTP setting are considered a first line of treatment and a standard of practice in treating patients with opioid use disorder. We don't no more long say, well, you're only on Vicodin, you can't stay. You know, we're, we're not looking at it like that. Many patients seeking OTP treatment had decades long history of illicit opiate use and treatment attempts. Today, many patients seeking OTP care have no history of treatment and shorter history of opiate use. One year of physiological dependency is still required in most cases. OTP treatment options primarily located in the major cities and urban areas. Today, increase in available options of treatment for opioid use disorder, including OBOTS. Uh, can you hear me still? Yeah, John, you're fine. Are you still able to hear me? I hear you fine. You're John. okay. Yes. Yeah, you're fine. You're okay, okay John. You're Okay. Yeah. Okay. Increase in available options uh, for treatment. I went through that, uh, including OBOTS, opioid-based um, office treatment, and increased number of OTPs throughout the state helps with this. Historically, many patients seeking OTP care classify themselves as heroin users, IV heroin users. Most patients seeking OTP care today responds to pharmaceutical and narcotic addiction or illicit fentanyl use. Majority of patients stabilize on 80 to 120 milligrams as an average dose. Some patients experience higher tolerances for opioids related to the strength of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. 
leading to potential, potential need for higher than average maintenance doses. I've seen doses go up into the 600s, 700s in some programs. Methadone considered gold standard for treating opioid use disorder during pregnancy. Today, new research suggests possibly, possibly, that buprenorphine may be better treatment option for opioid use disorder during pregnancy. Methadone still remains the gold standard in 2021. Common myths about opioid treatment programs. These are the things that people say, it rots my teeth, it's in my bones, it never gets out of my bones. Well, uh, that's a myth. And crime rates go up in neighborhoods where OTPs are located. Not in my backyard. Untreated opioid addiction is linked with high rates of illegal activity and incarceration, often related to the high cost of daily self-administration of narcotics to alleviate withdrawal symptoms. Receiving effective treatment is associated with a reduction in rates of crime and illicit behaviors. Myth, treating patients with medication-assisted treatment in the OTP setting is not cost-effective. That's the biggest lie. When I talk to programs in, in different counties, I tell them that they will save money if they treat their patients. Untreated opiate addiction is associated with high costs to the community in the form of overdose responses, emergency departments, and by police and rescue teams, drug-related car accidents, transmissions, all of this, court costs, probation, blah, 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 blah. Average cost of managing OUD, opioid use disorder, with methadone or buprenorphine in the OTP setting is between five to $6,000 per year. Comparable to the annual cost of managing other chronic diseases such as diabetes and kidney disease, I pay that for diabetes, $10,000 just for my medicine. Of the estimated $78 billion cost of the opioid epidemic in 2013, only 3.6% of that cost was for treatment. Methadone treatment today, oh, let me go back down here. Methadone treatment today is now being used to help those dependent on fentanyl and methamphetamine. Problem is there is no blockade dosage for fentanyl and uh, using methadone. This keeps the dependent fentanyl patient from stopping his dependency on fentanyl. They still wanna go out and try to get high from fentanyl. That's where we're, we're going. Patients are needing larger doses of methadone and this is not a guarantee to work. Retention is similar, but those wanting to stop fentanyl abuse are not doing it today. Fentanyl and carfentanyl have become the scourge of the opioid using population and 95% of patients in the Midwest are, are Caucasian. Why I say this is because on TV, you would not notice that. Methadone does, not, does help without uh, methadone, help without methadone, the overdose rate would, rate would triple. Methadone doses does, does help and without methadone rate, uh, overdose rates would triple. It has tripled and we see no stopping. Methadone still benefits our patients because they seem to slow down on daily uh, or multiple times a day usage of fentanyl. Typically, at my program, they'll go from using seven days a week to one or two days a week. The average dose today is from 80 to 120 milligrams, with some going into the 200s. There's more myths about it. Patients with opioid use disorder have historically been labeled as difficult to treat due to high rates of mortality and premature departure from abstinence-based treatment settings. Receiving effective treatment with medication increases retention rates, prevents overdose, reduces transmission of HIV and hepatitis C, and improves quality of life. Myth, patients taking methadone experience euphoria and are not truly sober. Patients who are physiologically dependent upon opioids who use methadone as prescribed do not experience euphoria. Rather, withdrawal symptoms and cravings are controlled, making it possible for individuals to participate in activities such as schoolwork, childcare, operating a motor vehicle, and other activities that an individual without opioid use disorder might do in a typical day. Okay. If the regulations are not enough oversight and the rules are interpreted by the state opioid treatment authorities arbitrarily and often wrong, providers must maintain their programs with a dwindling workforce. We have only 50% of data 2000 wave buprenorphine physicians even practice due to the many regulations that they must follow. But the many rule changes and strict oversight of patients are not always given the easiest choice when it comes to methadone treatment. Positives, in the 1980s, weekend take homes were the best that could be done in 2021 most have patients who earn up to 30 to 31 days of a month of unsupervised take-home medication. There are different phases of levels depending on favorable urine drug screens. 
And I mean favorable is that somebody does not have any illicit or other drugs that they shouldn't have in there. Unfavorable means the other. Screens and compliance with treatment. Most programs are now closed on Sundays and take-homes are given. Patients continue to continue in treatment, but less attendance helps them lead normal lives, working and supporting their families. Many changes have occurred in the last 10 years, but stronger opioids have flooded the market. Fentanyl has caused many overdoses, deaths, and ruined many families. Methadone is still the gold standard for those dependent on other opioids and still works for pregnant moms who are using methadone, using opioids. I uh, began the Mothers on Methadone program back in the 19, um, about 1998. And Dr. Uh, Finnegan, uh, Finnegan from um, Maryland, she helped uh, with that tremendously because she's uh, one that takes care of the neonatal abstinent um, uh, syndrome that uh, the forms they fill out to see how a, a baby's doing um, when they're being uh, weaned off of uh, opioids. Many more programs with certified addiction nurses and certified addiction specialists who are both nurses and physicians help to guide patients struggling from opioid use disorder. Though we see, seem to know more about opioid use disorder today than we did 50 years ago, not much has changed in how our patients are treated. Stigma continues, and although the AMA lists opioid use disorder as a brain chemistry disease, is it really treated like diabetes, obesity, cancer, or other diseases? I don't think so. Addiction nurses and physicians continue to be scrutinized, and unbelievable regulations determining how they practice remain the norm. No other doctor in this field is told how, how often they have to see their patient, how long they have to see their patient, and how long the medical director has to stay in the program during the day. Much has changed since the mid-1960s, and much more is known about treating opioid use disorder. The problem is that although changes has come, we still find ourselves caught in a time warp where addiction and dependency to opioids remains the same, but so do barriers. One of the most regulated and scrutinized industries need to change. Methadone has been blessing to countless people. Methadone saves lives. Diversion from licensed methadone, licensed treatment programs is simply very low and overall not a major street drug. Many families have been allowed the opportunity to become whole with medicated assisted treatment using methadone. Buprenorphine also, and some that need naltrexone uh, are the uh, Vivitrol. As we see today with the advent of new drugs for the treatment of cancer, diabetes, hypertension, there's not much for opioid use disorder. Methadone remains the gold standard, continuing to save lives as it did in 1964, then and now. I'll open this up to any questions. I know I went through it pretty quickly, but I wasn't sure I would get through all of this. So um, if there's any questions, please feel free to ask. I can check the chat, I guess. here. Uh, John, I've been kind of keeping uh, an eye on that. And yes, thank you very much because I'm, um, I'm really glad I... that you uh, have have left the time for some questions. I'm not hearing. Let me, let me see can if I can get this. Me? I don't know if everybody's in mute. Can you hear me okay? Is everybody else hearing me? Dana, I'm not here. I'm not uh, hearing very yes, well. Yes, we can either. hear you very well. Okay. Um, so the audience is hearing me, John. I'm not sure why you're not. Charlie. Could you possibly have your... No, tell Charlie I need him now because yeah. this thing is... Yeah, yeah it's not... It's this thing okay. is not... That I'm not hearing anybody. Okay. okay. We'll, right. we'll just all take a, a deep breath here for a minute because um, we, we were hearing you just fine, you. John. Okay. Hold on a second. I'm not hearing you as well. Right okay. Here. All right. 100 percent You stop going again. You're but not, now you're not hearing, John? Okay. I can hear now. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay. okay. So one okay. of the first questions, John, was... Could you talk a little bit about blind dosing that you mentioned earlier in your presentation? Okay. Yeah, I'll get into that. Blind dosing was back in uh, the you know 70s and 80s. Some clinics, about 25% of them, would not tell the patient what dose they were on when they came in, and they would it would be therapeutic with the doctor, the uh, counselor, and the nurse. So that uh, the the reason that I was told, and I never really agreed with it, and uh, when I went to New York to learn that that wasn't very good, um, 
it was because of therapeutic uh, complaining. Uh, why is he on this dose and why am, am I on that? I'm a dealer. I've got a dealer's habit. Uh, it was a lot of therapeutic game playing, and the doctor seemed to be did not want to deal with that. So we were allowed at that time to uh, to give them methadone, but not reveal the dose. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, now nobody does that hardly. There's a few programs still. Some of the some of the really restricted ones are doing that. So John, another question was: Could you discuss a little further? You talked about a year of physiological dependence being required. There's three re there's three things that happened uh, with methadone treatment back in the day. You had three special reasons. One was that you um, that you were pregnant for getting into a methadone treatment program. One, you was recently released from a penitentiary or from a prison six months, and the other that you was injecting. And back then they used to have, if you brought a friend that would sign an affidavit that you had, that they knew that you were physiologically addicted, uh, meaning that you were using opioids every day, you were injecting, you were whatever, um, they, they, there would be a paper that you could sign and they could sign them up. Today, it's not that way. Um, it's right now, most people you can tell by, first of all, their urine drug screens. Second, though, we didn't have the, the kind of urine. In 89, the urine drug screens were not as good as they are today. The confirmations weren't as good. And fi finally, we have fentanyl um, strips that are not doing too bad. And we can actually see, um, see some changes because we don't want to put somebody on uh, methadone that possibly is not addicted to opioids. So that's why that's what the physiological uh, part came from. Okay. Back in the day. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, there's been some discussion as you've been talking, John, particularly about the efficacy of methadone versus uh, Suboxone. Um, do you have any information about that? Do you have yes. and Arcan in it versus methadone? Yes, I'm doing an outcomes right now. Um, doctor, uh, my the doctor that works with me here is a, a fellow also in addictions medicine. Uh -huh. And we, we, we really are studying... Um, the efficacy and the and the outcomes of our suboxone patients as opposed to our methadone patients, and typically what we find out that the more that that patient is using a, a large amount of fentanyl, methamphetamine, that's the two that they're mixing mostly now, and some benzodiazepines typically do better on methadone, on uh, because suboxone does do well for people that I consider maybe they're they're uh, they've been in treatment before. Um, they, they're not quite, a, they're not using fentanyl on a daily basis, but they do have a, a, a pretty strong habit. But um, I think methadone is a stronger and it's a, a drug that'll, that'll, that'll take up that whole receptor. And I think patients feel it as opposed to some that don't, but don't, but don't say that it doesn't work for everybody. I, I have probably 160 suboxone patients and I've got about 90 methadone patients and some want to go back and forth and I tell them that's not good to do but um, we're having some good luck with methadone and suboxone so whatever works I'm happy. Okay. And, and what about um, if someone has been on methadone and then they want to go on suboxone or even vice versa somebody's been on suboxone and they want to go on methadone. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, me methadone to suboxone is extremely difficult, uh -huh. extremely. Um, I've had uh, very little luck with patients that are on 60 milligrams or less even, uh, even when they quit using methadone for, for a couple of days, which is hard for any opioid using person to quit one day, let alone two or three days. So what happens going from suboxone to methadone is extremely easy. Uh, if they stop using their suboxone Sunday night, Monday afternoon, I can give them 30 milligrams of methadone and it'll be fine. They will be fine. Okay. They, they must, they, you don't want to use suboxone with any kind of opiate, obviously, because of the, the naloxone effect. So you may go into precipitated withdrawal. The other thing is, is that method, when, when I have suboxone patients, or methadone patients that want to come to Suboxone, methadone stays in there a long time. So mm -hmm. even two to three days is not going to get it. Most people don't it, it really have withdrawal symptoms with methadone until the fifth and sixth day. That's why most babies are kept 
in ne uh, the neonatal intensive care are in uh, to find out and they keep them there for 96 hours or four days because they won't go into withdrawal typically for that long a period of time. So, okay, okay. Um, another question, Don, and I don't know, um, this would be interesting to me. What about opioid induced endocrinopathy? In, uh, opioid, you mean in, in endocrine, endocrine problems? Endocrine, they, they do have some endocrine problems, but it's not a, uh, it's, it's not methadone. The biggest problems with methadone is uh, QT elongation for the older people that have heart problems. So anytime you get to a, a certain dose, we have EKGs run. Um, we have uh, what they call a peak and trough run on them to see, you know, how they're metabolizing. Oh. And uh, that's the, that's the things that, that, that uh, happen. And then, and I've not had a lot of, not, not a lot of issues with that, but I have had uh, patients that come from programs that give high doses too soon and they don't check their EKG, they don't check their heart issues and things like that. If they have a heart problem, and a cure, especially QT is when the heart beats and, and then it releases again and beats. And it, 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 what happens is it, it makes it so long that it can throw them into um, heart problems and um, they can be, you know, you can die from it. So we're real careful with that. If they get, if they get over hundred milligrams, they're going to have an EKG and, and they're going to have a peak and trough. Okay, okay. Um, one of the things I want to point out in the chat, the chat has been very interesting discussion, but Emily McCall has put up an article uh, that's come out of JAMA from 2020, Comparative Effectiveness of Treatment, um, so which talks about, I guess, the uh, treatment pathways for opioid use disorder. So that's a really, really nice reference there as well. Um, I had a chance to look, chance to look at it because I was concentrating on <laughs> what I was yeah. saying. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm looking through it now. Um, okay. No, we uh, somebody asked about an EKG in house. We we do not run it in house. We send them. We have a special uh, uh, program here that's uh, th that they know that our program uh, that will send them get an EKG and they'll get read and everything. It'll get sent to us immediately. Uh, peak and troughs are done in two days. The way that a peak and trough is run is they'll come in the morning, they'll get their dosage. Uh, within two hours, they'll go get blood work done at uh, one of our uh, programs that do the blood work for us. And then the next day, before they come and get their dose, they'll get blood work done again. Then we'll get a probably five o'clock that, that same day, we'll get the answer. And uh, we'll find out if they're a fast metabolizer, um, uh, so that's, the, I was reading some, uh, they'll, they'll, we'll get the answer and, and know what's going on with, uh, with them pretty soon. And we have people on what they call split doses. Um, also somebody's on, uh, let's say 120 milligrams. We do this a lot for pregnant moms. We'll give them 60 in the morning and they'll take 60 home for them to take later on eight hours later. Um, that's for, that's a lot of times for pregnant moms, especially in the last trimester when their blood volumes go up. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So another question here that's interesting is what is the dose at which an EKG is run? And do you do your EKGs in-house or do you refer out? No, we, all of our EKGs are done by one person and we send them there one, one, uh, one specific place. Uh, we have Atrium, which is our, our, uh, it's a level one trauma center. We, everybody knows us. Uh, they know our doctors. Um, we send them there when they, if they hit a hundred milligrams, if that's where they're, where they're at hundred milligrams is typically the, the, where we do an EKG. Now, if they come in from another program and they, they show us that they have signs of any kind of issues and we try to get their, their, uh, all their, uh, work, workups from the program that they're at before we will send them that day to get an EKG. And remember, we do mental health here too. So our mental health uh, practitioner sends them for EKGs if they're on Vralar, if they're on any kind of uh, uh, drug that uh, they feel necessary to do that. Uh, so we, we do a lot of EKGs, a lot of peak and troughs. Uh, we don't really have a lot of people on, on higher doses. Our, do our average dose is between 80 and 90 milligrams right now. Okay, okay. That's very good. And, and buprenorphine, our, our average dose is about 16 milligrams, 16 to 20. No, no, you know, so, and. Yeah. Uh, 
And yeah. I have four four ladies that are pregnant right now, and two are on Subutex, two are on methadone. One just had a baby; the baby was fine. Uh, went home in three days, um, so we were just real happy about that. So, so this is an interesting question, I think, from Susan Tatum. Uh, can you say more about that? You see, methadone works better for individuals who are using fentanyl benzos uh, and uh, that, than suboxone. Yes, I do. I do think that it, um, we've had people here. We opened our OTP at this location in January. Uh, we've been doing suboxone here for two years before that. So we've had patients that wanted the method, wanted to try the methadone because they kept going back to um, fentanyl and whatever they, you know, Opana or whatever. So what happened was when they went to methadone, they simply stopped using as much. And I am a harm reduction guy. And if you go from seven days using to two days using, to me, that's an incremental help. And that, that, that's going to help them. Even though I always tell them that every time they inject or snort or whatever, however they take fentanyl, it could be their last time because you don't, you don't know. But I do see a lot of, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, our le the levels go down in fentanyl. Uh, we have a, a 250 level is one of our top levels. And uh, I've seen it go from 250 to 110 in, uh -huh. in, a, period of a, in a period of two weeks. And What's what it? we do, we do 30 milligrams. It's typical when they start. And then we raise them up incrementally, depending on um, what type of habit they had. Uh, we don't raise them up uh, over 60 milligrams until they've been here at least two or three weeks to see. And then we do all these different testings. We do cows. And uh, every time they, they ask for an increase, we'll do a cows. Okay. So um, there's some comments in here too, John, about just the dangers of using benzodiazepines with either methadone or um, suboxone, you know, that they, they both can certainly cause problems. Absolutely. Uh, but there, there's a question about what about alcohol, people who are using alcohol while on methadone? Um, what about that? Do, do we, treat, we treat alcohol like benzodiazepines and methadone. If a person, yeah. we do not restrict them from coming in if they're going, if they've been going to a psychiatrist or a, a doctor for a number of years and they're on clonopin or Xanax, but we request that they really, they start to go down on their dose. So we monitor uh -huh. them closely. We also have a doctor here that specializes in alcohol disorder. So we will send them, uh, we'll, they'll put them on Caprol and some of the other, other uh, drugs while they're on that. But we'll also, if they're on benzos and they're on illicit benzos, their dosage will not be raised as readily. It'll be raised slowly, maybe two milligrams to five milligrams. And then if they're on, if they continue to use methamphetamine or cocaine, we will not raise their doses because that is typically, um, it is just taking it right out of their system. It's just, uh, it's not, it's not something we like to do. Um, so we, 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 we watch that pretty closely. Okay. All right. Uh, and somebody, somebody else have any other questions? We still have a few minutes here. Somebody said something about methadone safe and recommended in pregnancy as needed breastfeeding. Okay. Yes, it is okay to breastfeed. Um, the only thing that really bothers, uh, it's kind of strange, marijuana is the one that goes through the breast milk pretty readily. Um, methadone, you know, a lot of, a lot of patients um, stay on methadone for three, three to six months for sure after they're pregnant because they don't know what, how they're, they're going to have any postpartum problems. Uh, we, we monitor our, our pregnant women, whether they're here or not, for up to six months. We've had, in, since 1989, the doctor that I worked with, we had over 600 live births. We had one fetal demise in all those years, and that was for a cord wrapped around their neck. Every one of those other babies went home, and uh, you know, I don't. Today, I get calls from some of them, 25 years, 28 years, uh, thanking us that they they took care of their moms. So. Um, Methadone has, has worked for me because it, uh, it saved a lot of lives. Okay. Um, one of the questions too about benzos, do you impose a limit of the methadone dose if they are positive for ben benzos? We, what, we, what, we, what we try to do is we try to get them off of a benzo, uh, 
what, what, what their benzo of choice is and go to a, a lower one, a lower level one. Our psychiatrist, anybody that's on benzos, anybody that's on methamphetamine, we, they have to see the psychiatrist or the nurse practitioner psychiatrist. My nurse practitioner psychiatrist is excellent. She does holistic medicine also. So she's had a lot of, a lot of success uh, with patients that continue to use benzos illicitly um, and want to keep going up on their dose of methadone or suboxone. Okay. And, we, okay. Oh, for, and it was a question in here about pregnant women. Yes, we use Subutex for our pregnant women. As soon as we find out that they are pregnant, we change them over to Subutex. The other way, reason we use Subutex is if somebody is going in for surgery and they're on Suboxone and they don't want pain medication because obviously you're either going to stay on higher levels of Suboxone for pain or you're going to, get, you're going to be on sub, Subutex for pain. So that we do use it in those cases for uh, acute pain and acute um, problems with the, when they go to the hospital and have to have surgery. And then we, we return them back to Suboxone. Okay, let's see. Um, also a question, do you increase the patient's dose of the methadone uh, until they are withdrawal free uh, when, when you're implementing it? How many are withdrawal free? Excuse me again? No, do, do you continue to give methadone doses until they feel like they're withdrawal free? Yes, we, we try to, we try to, um, we use two different uh, things. We use the cows and then we use this, the, the other one, the subjective opioid withdrawal scale. And we don't tell them what we're doing so that they, because they're very, uh, you know, some of them can, they know some of the patients that we have know what they have to do to get a raise. They, you know, right. so we, ha I have a, I have all these charts in front of my window where they can look at, see pupils dilated or pupils this, pupils that, and they can, a lot of different things like that. So yes, we, we, we want, we monitor, we, we try to give them, if they continue to withdraw signs, we will up their dose continuously until we can get them to a dose that that's better, or they test positive just for methadone. So, okay. uh, I mean, we, we're, we, we do have, I'm looking for doc, Dr. Juma asked how many of your patients who are at 120 milligrams usually use 80 milligrams and sell the rest. Well, most of our patients uh, come six days a week and um, we, they couldn't give any of their medicine away because they take in front of us. So the, mm -hmm. the, the 120, if they had uh, taken, it would be a Sunday dose, which they would possibly, they could possibly do that. But um, typically they're not going to give away that if they're, if they're in, if they truly have gotten over that hump of treatment and mm -hmm. they really want to become abstinent from all other drugs. Uh, and I consider them uh, clean or whatever you want to call it, favorable. If they have um, just methadone in their urine or they just have Suboxone in it. Um, okay. So that's, that's, how that, and that's the answer to that. They can be instructed. One more I have here. Some patients report headaches with Naloxone. They can be instructed to spit out saliva or side effects such as headache. That one, um, you know, Nalox alone should be pretty benign, and it it, it it's it really doesn't unless they swallow it. It's not it's not going to be you know. It, I, I don't I don't see any uh, issues with that. Sometimes they have headaches. Can skin can skin test for naloxone allergy if needed? Yes, they can be. They can go to the hospital and uh, can go and get their. They can get checked and see if naloxone is bothering them. It's rare that we have that. The only time that we use Subutex um, instead of uh, Suboxone is if they have some problems with their liver and it can, they can come back with uh, um, something from the hospital that they've had liver tests. That was in there, um, you know, uh, so I'm just looking at, I'm just, I'm just looking through these. Um, so I didn't I, miss any. John, we have, uh, we have almost just one minute left. Oh, so. I'm sorry. It, it's about time to wrap up, but there is one last question. It sure. uh, has to do with gabapentin. Um, we've oh. had an awful lot of talk about the dangers of gabapentin. Okay. Uh, can you talk about that with, uh, with yes, the yes. medications? I also worked in the penitentiary real, real quick. And gabapentin used to be the drug of choice in the penitentiary. They'd take a lot of it and they'd get, it would make them uh, hallucinate. Gabapentin is used today because there was so many of the doctors were afraid to give any opiates out when they started coming, cracking down on, on the opioid thing. Mm -hmm. And they, they started giving gabapentin in large amounts. Um, 
I think that if it's if it's if it's monitored closely, we do have some on gabapentin, um, and uh, it's the better of the of the of the choices. If they're going to be on opiates or, or fentanyl or gabapentin, I'd rather see them on gabapentin. But it has become a problem, and um, we're working on that. We're trying to find ways to reduce it so that there may be no long, no no more than three hundred milligrams TID. Um, some of them are up to. 3,200 uh, milligrams a day, but uh, we, we try to keep it at the lowest effective dose. That's okay. that's what we do with okay. gabapentin. Well, listen, it is uh, straight up one o'clock on the East Coast now, and um, I just want to thank, I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, it's been as high as 321 people uh, here today uh, listening to your uh, talk here, John, on methadone then and methadone now. Uh, some really interesting comments in the chat. So I just want to thank you. Um, and uh, let's see, we want to talk about, there, there is a, uh, an evaluation and you will receive the link of the evaluation. And once you complete that, uh, for those of the nurses out here, you will then be sent back a, um, a certificate for one continuing education credit uh, for this webinar. So with that, uh, we will end. And I want to thank you all again. And thank you so much to John Silvani that was very, very informative in so many ways. Thank we you so much too. Next time. Thank you all. And if you ever have any questions about it, please call me uh, and I'll be happy to talk to anybody. Okay. Thank you so much, John. All right. Bye, thank everybody. you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.